All right, welcome everybody to a new episode of The Sherman Show. I'm Jeff Sherman here with my co-host, Sam Lau. Mm -hmm. And today we are doing a video uh, podcast once again. I keep forgetting to advertise that they're video until after the fact, so I'm sure no one wants to, after listening to us, go watch on videos. So it's on our YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash double line capital. Uh, that's the capital with an A, as some people think that we are the capital of something. Uh, it's not the capital, it's an O. So anyway, you can catch it there. You can see who we have in the studio with us today, uh, obviously remote. Uh, we have Lori Heinel. Uh, she is from State Street. She is the global CIO. Congratulations on the uh, on the appointment, too. I know you've been moving up the ranks there. Yeah, and she oversees all the investment capabilities from index funds, ETFs, active, passive, multi-asset, alternatives. Um, if it trades, if it's an NFT, if it's something else, she probably covers it. So, Lori, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me. And so, uh, first of all, I think what I, what I really uh, find engaging is that you have an investment team of over 600 individuals. What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis when you have 600 people reporting into you and giving you all these great ideas? What's a typical day look like overseeing 600 different investment heads? <laughs> well, as you can imagine, it's pretty eclectic. Uh, you know, first and most important thing is understand what's going on in markets and what that might mean for our portfolios on that particular day. And we're not really day traders in the sense that we're hyper focused on a particular market move on a particular day. But it does feed into overall thinking about positioning, uh, with co communications that we might have with clients, looking at how that's impacting performance. And as you know, we uh, cover a broad swath, so everything from indexing all the way out to the uh, full active spectrum. So being attuned to what's going on globally and what might impact client portfolios is job number one. And then, as you can imagine, there's a lot of other uh, activities, whether it be you know team management, I mean, uh, building the right kind of culture at the organization, making sure that we're attracting, retaining, rewarding talent. Uh, that takes up a big chunk of my day. And then lastly are all the projects, right? So uh, I, I think all of us as senior leaders have a number of things going on uh, related to how we want to reinvent our business and related to how we want to drive product and marketing and other activities. So it's a, it's a pretty crazy day. And then, of course, uh, spending time with people like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so on that note, you hit on something, too, that we've been really uh, digesting as we talk about returning to the office and you know, what the world looks like post pandemic. And you mentioned the word culture. And I think of State Street as a, you know, one of those top tier firms that really sets culture. Mm -hmm. How are you guys thinking about that approach to the pandemic of preserving that culture and enhancing that culture too, right? We always talk about preservation, but a lot of times we want to improve ourselves, right? So <laughs> what are some of the initiatives that you're trying to undertake, not just as a senior leader, but also from the investment side and thinking with your CIO hat on? Yeah, you know, great question. I think historically our culture has always been one of trust and fiduciary mindset and client centricity. So those are always words that have been used to describe our culture. And I think we really embody that. One of the things that was interesting, though, as we went through COVID and, and sort of remote work was that we had to be more nimble. We had to uh, push decision making down further in the organization. Uh, we gathered differently. So it wasn't as hierarchical because we had to get things done. And oftentimes the person who was in a position to advance the agenda might not have been the person that was in the particular reporting line. So I think one of the things that we've been focusing on is how do we harness that um, that, uh, I don't know, that energy and, and that kind of bottoms up uh, urgency as we return to office and uh, break down those silos and, and keep them broken down. Because again, as you know, everything in investing is connected. And so the idea that you have a team that's just focused on indexing or just focused on client servicing or just focused on something else really doesn't work so well. And I think COVID and the re remote office environment let us be a lot more experimental about what teaming and virtual teaming might mean. So that's a cultural attribute that I want to nourish. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that, too. And just interaction, too. It's a different level of interaction, too, yeah. where... You, you know, you're not bothered by certain uh, certain things that you get pulled off the desk for or something or, you know, uh, we still still when the compliance office calls and my my teams is ringing. I know there's yeah. something important there. Yeah, yeah that, that's always important. That's right? the call you take always, no matter always. where you are. Yeah. So it's compliance or Jeffrey Gumlock. I always take those two calls. Right. Um, but that being said, 
you know, let's think about SSGA too and your evolution too. And, and you, you brought up a good point of like, whether it's in vaccine, um, which some people will call passive, some people call it a different type of active. But what are you seeing on the forefront too? Because you were innovators in a lot of the ETF space and the like. What are you seeing as wholesale trends within the industry? And as a CIO, let's say from that perspective, how are you trying to capitalize on these things? Are you agnostic to vehicles? You know, what are you thinking about when it comes to deploying the capital and these innovations that you've seen in the industry? Well, there's a lot to unpack there, but let me comment on a couple of things. I think, first of all, um, the indexing trend is going to continue, and we've seen it in spades over the last couple of years as we've moved from being much more equity-centric to being much more fixed income centric and also global. So the idea of indexing as a capability is one that we're keen to continue uh, to you know, promote and, and do a great job at. So certainly that's a big uh, part of the business. I think the other thing though, is that we do believe that going forward, the returns available to investors are gonna be somewhat muted. Now, we're, we're likely gonna have a nice bounce coming out of COVID in you know, 2021, 2022 from a global backdrop standpoint, a global backdrop standpoint rather. And so that likely will lead equities higher. Uh, but fixed income you know, anchored on you know, very, very paltry yields means that a diversified portfolio is gonna struggle uh, to get out of the you know, low to mid single digits from a return perspective. So how do you selectively weave in other kinds of active capabilities, whether they be true stock picking and bond picking, or whether they be tactical allocation processes, or maybe other things uh, that are critically important. And then the other place that I would say we're spending a lot of time uh, kind of thinking about things is on the risk side, because Again, this is a really crazy market. We've lived through crazy markets before, but one of the things that I think we keep getting reminded of as investors is there are risks looming out there. You may not see them at the moment, uh, but if you're not doing a lot of diagnostic and you know preparing yourself uh, to weather various kinds of storms that might come from a variety of directions, then you're not staying ahead of the curve. So those are a couple of things that are definitely places that we're investing. Yeah, well, obviously, Lori, you're not buying stonks because stonks only go up. You know, <laughs> you're still on that old school stocks where they do go both directions. So that's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's considered an alternative asset class or not, but um, <laughs> so so well, jokes aside, well, soon, stocks will be alternative asset classes if we're not careful, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, uh, you know, I, I think there's, yeah, there was a research report a few years ago that said, you know, right, that you buy stocks for income and bonds for capital appreciation, right? So. <laughs> You, you never know when things get a little inverted here. So, uh, you know, you touched on something about the paltry level of yields. And so we, we've seen a, a lot of people uh, talk about the death of a 60-40 portfolio. Is there really a 60-40 portfolio? Does anybody really have that in your conversation with clients? I know we all talk about it from a theoretical construct, but did it ever exist? Or was it something that we just all kind of prognosticate about to, to try to illustrate the purpose of diversification? Well. The reality is if you look at the overall market portfolio, right, which is obviously not held by any particular investor, it looks a lot like 60-40. <laughs> uh, and, and by that, I mean just the market cap of all the major asset classes around the world. Um, and I would say that a lot of our institutional segments, particularly if you think about, you know, defined benefit plans or some of those uh, segments, they look a lot like 60-40, at least from a benchmarking standpoint as do target date funds, right? So the 60-40 from, the, from a, a standpoint of an aggregate capital allocation or from the standpoint of a benchmark, if you will, I think is still alive and well. As a actual portfolio implementation, it's been dead a long time, <laughs> right? So this idea that um, you know, somehow a global ag and a global equity is really the, the right set of things to be invested in, I think that's been a concept that's gone out the window for probably decades now. And the question is, is the new thing all that different? So in some cases, it's actually not. I think one of the things that we're finding is that the endowment model is really not that different when you look at the beta drivers within that portfolio. You know, clearly illiquidity is an additional component of that kind of portfolio. But in terms of the correlation to major market indices, Things like private equity are actually pretty correlated to equities. Uh, so I think the really the devil has been in the details of how you nuance exposure to various uh, sub-asset classes uh, versus actually throwing out the window. But just a, a, a simple kind of set it and forget it, buy a basket of public uh, traded stocks and buy a basket of bonds, that idea has been gone for a long time. 
So you bring up a good point on the endowment model. I think everyone had envy of David Swenson, you know, back in the Yale, and he put out this nice book, and you know, everybody <laughs> chased that. And there was a lot of this stuff going into private markets and illiquidity. But let's let's talk more about you know one of your bigger channels, the retail channel. What what, what you know, you talked about the sixty forty has been somewhat dead. But from a retail component or end investor or an advisor perspective, mm -hmm. what does that portfolio look like today? And again, it doesn't have to be specific, yeah. but how is it different? How has it evolved? And how are you seeing people implement uh, this, let's call it a new way of thinking? Sure. And, and you may know that we, like many providers, have model portfolios, which we distribute to end investors. And I mentioned target date funds as a kind of you know, portfolio uh, mechanism, if you will. Certainly most uh, retirement plans have some version of a diversified allocation portfolio, typically a target date fund that investors could invest in. I think there are a couple of big trends that we've seen. First of, is more granularity, right? So long gone are the days when those portfolios were primarily U.S. large cap stocks, think Nifty 50, and sort of core bonds, treasury bonds, for example. Uh, today, you see a lot more eclecticism across. So you see international stocks, you see emerging stocks, you see uh, small caps, things of that nature. Uh, and then certainly in the bond portfolio, similarly, a lot more focus on credit, on high yield, maybe even emerging debt, other credit instruments that are going to get you incremental additional yield. I think the other big uh, development has been the addition of alternatives. Um, so, you know, real estate, you know, in the form of REITs, typically uh, gold or other kinds of commodities or other alternative, you know, currency types of uh, elements in the portfolio. So that idea of adding these diversifiers has been an increasing trend over the last couple of decades. And then I think lastly, and something that still, you know, I would argue hasn't quite gotten to prime time is alternatives. And by alternatives, I mean a variety of things, certainly illiquids like private real estate, private debt, private credit, things of that nature, private equity, uh, but also increasingly other things like annuities. So if you think about um, you know, a, a financial planner, oftentimes they'll have a much broader toolkit than just the investment array. They have some other things like insurance and, and other things that can be integrated in that portfolio. And so I think the big trend in wealth management, I believe, over time will be the integration of some of those things as well. Yeah, no, we, we've heard that too. And it's something, you know, we, we've talked to folks about on the decumulation phase of life that you should be spending something to buy some annuities to get mm -hmm. some of those streams. And obviously it's lower cost annuities right, and right. well-managed and well-ran. But I, I think you, you nailed it right there when you said wealth management. So it's not as much, you know, when we talk to a typical advisor that it's about as much as asset allocation, what you and I do on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis, but it's more about delivering that in solution. But you know, you, you keep mentioning alternatives, and what I heard in there was gold. But what about the rest of the commodity complex too? There's been a lot of fervor there. I know you have views on inflation, like sure. what what is, what is your view on the commodity space today, and where that should be in, in investors' portfolios? Because I think real estate, you know, you, you mentioned REITs. A lot of people still own real estate themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're already heavily allocated there. So adding REITs isn't always great at the margin. But what about some of these other things? Because private equity and private debt are hard to access. So I'm curious your view there. Yeah, so you know, certainly commodities are more easily accessed through indices and ETFs and other kinds of products that invest in a bright, broad swath of commodities. And the way we think about commodities is really a couple of uh, areas. Number one is it is another way to play the global growth story, right? So if you are, you know, you do believe that we're going to have a rapid pickup in global growth in 2021 and into 2022, and maybe even beyond, depending upon how the infrastructure uh, plan comes into play, you know, that's a great way to participate without the idiosyncratic risk that you have in a particular equity that you might be looking uh, to, to play that growth story around. So that's certainly one area. I think the other thing that's interesting about commodities is you, you can uh, break it down. It doesn't have to be, I'm just going to buy everything. So if you don't like energy, you can do something that's a little bit more soft goods related or foodstuffs or currency or, uh, you know, or, or precious metals or things of that nature. So you do have a lot of different um, ways that you can play that and you can look at what's going to diversify your other exposures uh, while you're going through that process. So, so we, we do have a position in commodities right now that's uh, not typically a, uh, a strategic allocation. It's a tactical allocation, and it is part of that growth story. But I think for a lot of investors, thinking about that as a different play, 
And the last thing I would say is one of the other questions I've gotten you know, over time is emerging markets versus commodities. And you know, there again, not all emerging markets are created equal, but if part of the reason you're investing in emerging markets equities is because of the growth story, commodities is a different angle to play that as well. Got it. I kind of want to stick with the theme of just the the alternative assets, and we've talked about some of the more traditional alternative assets today, the, the you know real estate, private equity, gold. But you know, the rise of the what's the new alternative asset, cryptocurrencies, you know the NFTs that we started talking about, blockchain. I just wanted to get your thoughts on you know, of the future of cryptocurrencies or blockchains as you know, in particular, a financial asset, do you think it has legs? Because interest has certainly been high and crypto investment vehicles are also on the rise. I mean, is this a long, you know, perhaps a longer fad, a 10-year fad in the making, or is it truly the future? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think cryptos are here to stay. <laughs> and I also think that blockchain is really the more important uh, sort of innovation, if you will. So blockchain Will, will facilitate transactions in a way that is sort of the way that credit cards changed money changing uh, many, many years ago. So uh, big fan of blockchain, uh, not necessarily a fan of crypto, but believe crypto is going to be here for a while, particularly if we start to see more of a tie uh, to underlying assets like you know other um, you know, fiat currencies, for example. Uh, we rec recently did a piece and we keep coming back to the same basic conclusion which is that for institutional investors or even for um, most retail investors who are focused on, uh, you know, kind of long-term, you know, capital allocation and long-term growth of their asset pool, these are highly volatile instruments. Um, they don't provide consistent correlations with other asset classes in the portfolio. Uh, there's no sort of underlying value model that you can put against them to determine whether they're worth zero or $350,000 uh, or some other number. So I'm not that's not a forecast. It's just a random choice of a number. So uh, for those who are watching this from a compliance standpoint out there. Um, so we keep coming back to the same answer, which is they are not ready for prime time as a, uh, as a part of a diversified portfolio. That doesn't mean that they never will be but they're not today. Uh, what, what we think would motivate that would be a, a bit of regulation, believe it or not, because then you might have a little bit more of a, a playing field that's more transparent and visible and you know, be better uh, usability and acceptability as a medium of exchange. So as those things start to evolve, one could envision a different answer, but today uh, not ready for prime time. Yeah, it's tough to have a medium of exchange when countries just outright ban it, right? I think we saw Turkey this week discussing that as well. Um, we did indeed. So, so let, let's pull it back to what you're doing today. So, you know, we, we hear about valuation being rich. I mean, if you, you look at backward looking metrics, and this typically happens after a recession, but uh, we had some pretty extreme readings on valuation going into the pandemic. Here we are, um, you know, sitting after the, after the fact. Um, with you know asset prices near record highs across many assets, right, uh, including the bond market. Um, so people have thrown out the the idea that you know this has been because of the quantitative easing, it's the fiscal response. Um, how do you think about valuation today? Has has your view changed? Are you trying to incorporate something given the dynamics that you know? Uh, People talk about fiscal policy like it never existed prior to 2020. You know, like all of a sudden there's this magical thing we found called fiscal authority. So, you know, fiscal's always been there. So a question becomes is like, how are you thinking about that and trying to incorporate that into your asset allocation views today? Is it different this time? Is it not? Um, does that cause reservation? And, and how are you thinking about your risk taking today, given those views? Yeah, well, the, the first thing I would say is that our long-term asset class forecasts are very low. <laughs> so I referenced this a little bit earlier. If you look at the 10-year expected return on equities, for example, we have a you know five or a six handle, depending upon where you are in the world. So much below the rule of thumb that we all grew up with, which is you know eight to ten percent or something of that nature. And if you look at the long-term expected return on fixed income assets, it's actually in some cases negative or very, very slightly positive. So the first implication for the current valuation levels is what's the forward return over, again, most investors' time horizon. We think that that's going to be quite low. So that's number one. The second piece of it, though, is 
how to deploy capital today and how do valuation levels factor into your tactical allocation, right? And I used to joke that um, everybody thought it was really hard uh, to invest money in the wake of the global financial crisis. Uh, so in March 2009, it felt like everything was scary and you didn't want to put money anywhere. But actually, had you put money pretty much anywhere, you would have made a lot of money. <laughs> and we're sort of in the opposite place now where you look around and a lot of things look pretty rich. And so it is a relative game against a backdrop, which, as you say, shows most assets are relatively inflated. So we've been doing a couple of things. Uh, first of all, is focus on whatever fundamentals you have. Right. So we do believe we're going to see a kick up in global growth in 2021. We think the U.S. is poised to do uh, on a relative basis pretty well. So we're overweight to U.S. equities, for example. Uh, we look at other places in the world. So we think emerging markets writ large look OK, again, from an equity standpoint. Largely, that's a China play. Uh, China continues to post pretty good numbers this year. Uh, or we expect them to post pretty good numbers this year. So that's another place where we're deploying capital. We're less interested in Europe. We think Europe is uh, still battling COVID and, and not making the kind of progress we think they, they need to make. And they're also geared to other parts of the world that are still quite slow. And then the last thing I would say is if you look at, um, you know, on the fixed income side, you've got uh, policy support all over the place, right? So um, trying to find those pockets where there's, you know, relative attractiveness. So we like credit in part because we've seen, you know, reasonably low default rates. Um, we've rotated recently out of high yield into more high grade because we think if as um, treasuries back up a bit, bit more, we think it's actually possible that credit could trade through treasuries at some point in time. That may not be a persistent uh, thing, but it, it could happen at least on a short term basis. We've seen it before, um, whereas high yield at, at current levels, we think looks pretty nosebleed. So it's all about trying to think through over some short term horizon, call it six months, where do we think we can get some relative extra juice out of the portfolio? Yeah, it seems like there's, you know, along that lines of constructing the portfolio, there's been a lot of chatter around consumer price inflation. Mm -hmm. um, inflation visas are banging the drums again. You know, that inflation's coming, it's probably going to last beyond the, the base effects and it could run hot for, for a number of years. If we were to assume they're right, what is what are some of the ways that people can think about protecting their portfolio against mm -hmm. the the impact of inflation? Because you know we, we're starting out with very low uh, bond yields. You know a lot of you know a lot of parts of the curve and across various sectors we're, we're seeing negative real yields after adjusting for inflation and uh, uh, inflation expectations. And then with the yeah. most recent print on CPI, it takes you know some of the realized inflation turning it into to negative real yields as well. But you know. Some of the other, you know, even with equities, if we start to have hot inflation absent uh, and accompanying growth with it, yeah. that could be you know, problematic for that part of the portfolio as well. And you spoke about commodities earlier, and that's traditionally been known as a, a way to hedge against inflation. But how can people think about or how should people think about their portfolio, I guess, given the inflation expectations? Well, the first thing I would say, just kind of picking up on a couple of threads that you laid out there, is a little bit of inflation is not a bad thing, certainly not a bad thing for equity. So if you think about, if you look historically at uh, different inflation regimes, equities do really well in that modest inflationary kind of environment. It's only once inflation starts to get up over about 5% or so that you start to see equities really struggle. And that's kind of intuitive because it, against a backdrop of inflation, companies have a bit more pricing power. And so they are able to actually pass costs along to consumers and often use that as an opportunity. So, so equities can actually be a pretty good place to be if the inflation doesn't get completely out of hand. You know, bonds, on the other hand, against a backdrop where yield levels are so very, very low, there's just no room for error there. So you know, short on the curve, uh, high in quality, and you know, don't expect a lot, but hopefully you just don't lose a lot of money. And, and I would say in 2021, our big story for our investors has been how you navigate fixed income in 2021 is going to be the difference in how your overall portfolio performs because we saw 2021 as being a very choppy market for fixed income investors. I think the other thing that you have to do is look a little bit under the hood, though, because a lot of what has uh, buoyed equities have been a, a couple of major themes. 
One is the hyper growth, right? And so, and we saw this earlier this year as interest rates started to back up in the US that some of those high flying growth stocks started to get re-rated a bit because obviously uh, they were at nosebleed valuation levels in some cases. But then you look at other parts of the market that have done well over the last several years are some of the uh, fixed income alternative equities, right? So you think utilities, you think REITs, you think some of these other things that uh, generate a lot of income and investors sort of moving into those spaces. But here again, they're much more threatened if you start to see any kind of backup in rates, particularly if it's accompanied by uh, more systemic uh, inflationary pressure. So, so we think there are lots of things you can do within a portfolio, but equities remain a good place to be. As you say, commodities, sort of a diversified basket of real assets can be a good place to be. Uh, but then also look under the surface because some parts of the market will be more impacted by that uh, inflationary pressure than others. Yeah, so I got two things on that. First of all, you, you talked about you know managing the fixed income, and that's going to be important for the overall asset allocation this year. And so you were talking about being short on the curve, high quality. Uh, to me, that sounds like a good place to be. It's worked very well. Kudos to your team for getting that right. Um, we we agree with a lot of that. However, you know when I think about the reason people own bonds is to help offset some of the risk mm -hmm. in their equity portfolio. So if you're running shorter duration. Higher credit quality. The higher credit quality is not going to melt down, but is it there to give you that kick to offset yeah. some drawdown? So, how are you thinking about risk management given that view? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and there again, I think we've taken a much more diversified approach to risk management in the portfolio than maybe conventionally. So, we tend to still keep a small allocation to long duration treasuries uh, because that's got the most kick, if you will. If our core thesis about growth goes off the rails and we start to see, you know, pressures the other direction, um, we have used things like gold, for example, in the past as a diversifier. Uh, that's a nice diversifier in both deflationary as well as hyperinflationary environments. We've recently um, pared back that position because we we don't think that this is an environment where we need that kind of protection. In some cases, we've rotated into other parts of the fixed income markets where there, again, the risk reward trade off looked good and the correlation you know, was somewhat negative to, to equity markets. So we, we tend to think about uh, diversifying against uh, that kind of market sell off in a more eclectic way than we would have when, you know, bond yields had a lot further to drop. I mean, you'll get some kick if stock markets uh, fall off, but, um, you know, you're just not, you, you know, with, with bonds at a, you know, a one or a 2% uh, kind of level, you just can't get the kind of juice out of it that you would have gotten when bonds were at five or 6%. Yeah, no, completely fair. And, and I agree with the, the long bond concept, at least at these levels, it's starting to look a little more interesting, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, at least, at least there is that potential. You, you could argue a 1% long bond, you got, you got one last move, you know, and like if right. you can nail it. So, uh, so as you think about that too, in trying to be more tactical, what, what's a tactical part of the market that you don't hear a lot of others talking about that you're very excited about? I'm trying to come out with the, you know, people always ask, what's your best idea? Yeah. What's your best idea portfolio? I tell people, we don't run a worst idea portfolio, yeah. by the way. You know, most of them are the best for what we're trying to do. So what is something that you guys find attractive that, or you think that people are overlooking in terms of not risk? That, that's all. That's a common question, but actual reward opportunity. Yeah, you know, one that we've been um, trumpeting for a while that individual investors, retail investors in particular, are underweighted to is emerging debt, uh, right? So you'd say, well, ooh, you know, emerging markets again. And uh, one of the backdrops there is that, you know, the emerging markets of today, while they certainly have stresses in there, there are definitely cases. You look at Russia, you look at Brazil, there are places to kind of run away for in the aggregate, they're in much better shape than they were, you know, a, a few short years ago. Uh, they have a lot more policy flexibility than they once did. And uh, by the way, their currencies are also relatively undervalued. So one of the areas that we have been encouraging you know, clients to look at again is emerging debt and particularly focused on local currency where you can get a little bit of additional uh, juice from a yield perspective. And you also that have that potential currency appreciation. Again, not without risk, uh, but an area that we think is under uh, sort of uh, overlooked a bit by particularly retail investors. Yeah. And so um, as you think about that, let's turn that around now too. What's one risk that you think investors are somewhat ignoring today? 
or at least not paying enough attention to? Obviously, you guys are thinking about it, but what, what is something that you're seeing? Is there excess risk taking? Is it margin? Like, what, what type of things are you thinking about? Are you, you observing out there? Well, from a conventional standpoint, so you just sort of think about a traditional portfolio, we have for quite a long time felt that the uh, sort of high growth tech areas, uh, in particular tech areas, were way overvalued, right? That there just was no room for error and that uh, investors continued to play, pay nosebleed levels. And our core thesis there was one of a couple of things would happen. Either they would just run out of steam and collapse back to earth, which you know wouldn't be a good outcome, or other parts of the market would start to you know find their footing and, and benefit more from you know a broad economic recovery. And so they would close the gap, in which case those stocks would underperform. So in broad measure, that's been an area. But I think there's there's there are lots of fringe things to be worried about out there. I mean, when you when you watch what happened, you know, with GameStop and and some of the um, activity, and, and again, I'm not commenting on the stock as a stock, but just as a phenomenon, right? Uh, when you start to see the the way that retail money can move markets to that degree, that starts to get a little bit troublesome because you wonder, do investors um, who are participating in those kinds of activities, do they understand uh, the riskiness? attached to the kinds of positions they're taking on. When you look at, um, you know, some of the SPAC phenomenon, you know, here are, um, you know, entities that are uh, being invested in before you even know what you're actually buying, you know, so you have to sort of say to yourself, um, would I do that under normal circumstances? Maybe not, but all of a sudden it's become a, a way to um, you know, participate in a different kind of market, if you will. I, I, and I think the NFTs or the, the non-fungible tokens are kind of an interesting one because I'm sort of drawn to the idea that if I could have the only copy of a uh, live performance by one of my favorite musicians, Elton John, like that would be really cool. And I might pay a fair amount of money for that, but I hardly think about that as an investment. Um, but there's this sort of intersection now between some of these digital technologies and investing that I don't think we've really seen the uh, fundamentals that underpin that. Right. No, I mean, I, I think that's a good point, too, is that um, maybe it is more of the intersection of hobbies. You're seeing this with now the resurgence of trading cards, right? That, you know, things we did in our use, you know, uh, that are they're having resurgence <laughs> again. And so potentially that there Beanie is Beanie Babies. Just, that's my favorite one. I, my, yeah. my, I remember my kids had a platypus that was worth $750. It's like I should have <laughs> sold it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, hopefully you still have it and, and maybe you can NFT it and, and make even more. Um, there you go. You know, but as you, as you think about it, I mean, these are just crazes and, and look, they're hobbies and interests as well. So, you know, I think it, it's, it's interesting to say that what, what you said there was that it may not be an investment though. Right. It may not be a way to build long term wealth, but you enjoy it. You get some benefit of it. And, and there's something to be said there. Um, another question in there on the whole idea that, you know, thematically, the world has been changing. There could be some reflation is value versus growth. I, I got to pick your opinion here. I got to pick your brain on this. You know, we, we've seen a movement uh, the last few weeks. It's been value struggled a little bit against growth as you know, we've seen yields come back down. We just see a more negative tone with the virus. And you mentioned Europe. It's just a disaster over there right now. And, you know, you're seeing, I think it was worldwide today, the most cases that we've had to date yeah. new cases. Yeah. So a lot of negative prints out there. You can see that. So um, is this a good time to be thinking about the value rotation? Well, first of all, do you believe in it? And if so, is it another good opportunity to maybe reduce some of those high flying names that you talked about earlier or those sectors of the market and try to uh, posture for maybe a recovery in value or is value just dead? Let's write it off. Let's just trade NFTs and move on with it. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I do believe that there's value in value, right? So I'm, I'm not a write it off and the world's different this time and never again will value stocks uh, be a uh, rational investment. Um, so let's start there. I think all the conditions for value to finally um, have its day in the sun are there, right? And, and we've seen you know, a couple of quarters now of a pretty reasonable performance, although, as you say, literally every day, it's a little touch and go still. Um, first and foremost, if there is a global economic recovery and COVID cases aside, you know, all indications are that we're going to see a global economic recovery in 2021 that will have some legs. That is a very good backdrop for many of the sectors that we classically call value. So that should 
be a bit of a rotation from the high growth in an environment where growth was very, very dear to an environment where there are more parts of the market like materials and others that can participate. The other thing is that one of the things that's been a huge headwind for value has been this persistent race to the bottom in rates, right? So if you actually um, think about investing against a falling rate environment, it is very difficult for value investors to, uh, for the value factor to do well. And here again, we may not be uh, seeing significantly rising rates any time in the future, but think about it as a headwind that's now dissipated. So um, it used to be it was like blowing in her face, and now it's not. So it's not that same um, you know stress on value that you would have had as rates are going down. So you don't need rates to go back up. You just need them to kind of stabilize, and then it's a bonus if they start to go up, and some of the value sectors uh, benefit from that. Um, so so we would say, and, and oh by the way, valuation I mean, valuation looks much more attractive there. Although I will say that. Um, Sometimes those moves happen pretty quickly. So, you know, first quarter this year, energy being one of the best performing sectors. So there's been a big move now. And, and so have you missed some of that? Which leads me to my final point, which is value when it moves, it moves sharp. Um, so the, the good and the bad about value is if you miss, um, you know, sort of the first year or two, you, you probably don't participate. So as painful as it might be to hold value during those dull periods, uh, unless you think you can have perfect timing, it is an exposure that pays off in a very big way in uh, relatively short episodes. Okay, so no, I, I would agree with that too, and you know that that's why a lot of people don't realize that you know, usually coming out of a out of or out of a recession, value tends to do well. It is a more growth sensitive area. <laughs> Yes. Uh, which is kind of a, a strange misnomer out there about the naming of it. So mm -hmm. what I want to do real quick, Lori, is introduce a new concept I've been thinking about, and we're going to call it the speed round. Yeah. Um, and this is before we get to Sam's favorite part. I want to I want to try something here because you, you've, you've covered the gamut. And I want to just throw four topics at you real quick and tell me what's a what does an investor do? What's the best way? to play each one of these themes, okay? And so we'll just go okay. real quickly. What's the best exposure to get to play inflation? Tips. Growth. Oof, large cap US. <laughs> okay. Uncertainty. Cash. And taxes. Munis. Okay. So there's a diversified portfolio right there, right? <laughs> Four things that we've all concerned about, right? Inflation, the growth prospects, uncertainty, which we always have, and taxes, which comes just like death, unavoidable, right? So <laughs> um, again, look at that, how easy that was to come up with an asset allocation. Now it's on our listeners to come up with how to allocate those things, right? So Lori, thank you. Thank you for uh, playing that nice little <laughs> feature we have that will probably never be rolled out again. <laughs> came off the top of my head today. So, um, right. So we've been listening. We've been uh, we've been talking here about asset allocation. We've covered the gamut. What what are some final thoughts on the market, Lori? What what should people really be taking away from our interview today, April twentieth, twenty twenty one? What is the best advice you have to an investor right now today? Yeah, look, I, I think for investors who have long-term growth needs in their portfolio, equities look pretty good. It might feel a little bit toppy here, uh, but I do think that earnings are likely to come in pretty strong this quarter. There are legs to the growth story. There are legs to the economic recovery, and there are legs to corporate earnings. So I, I think that's a, a good place to be. And don't forget about bonds, but just try to be a bit more discriminating and uh, a bit more granular in the allocation there to try to capitalize on the incremental ability to get some yield and, and still protect the portfolio. So uh, it sounds a, a bit sort of trite and standard, uh, but I think sometimes going back to first principles during these kinds of environments uh, serves investors quite well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great advice. So this is Lori, he uh, Lori Heinel. Uh, global CIO at State Street Global Advisors. Thank you for your time today, Lori. Before we let you leave, though, can you tell uh, our listeners where they can get access to your thinking, your allocation views, your models? Where can they get access to the information you and your team put out? Yeah, the best place to go is to our spider website, spdr.com, uh, uh, and you can find a whole set of tools that they can use uh, for clients and understand better some of our capabilities. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Lori. It's been a pleasure having you on today. 
Hopefully our listeners got something completely out of this. But before we let you leave, I have to introduce you to Sam's favorite part of the show, which is a requirement before you can exit. So Sam, take it away. All right. And I echo that sentiment. Thanks, Lori. And I'm sorry that you had to endure Sherman's test uh, test the little segment there. But now I'm going to subject you to my favorite part, which is uh, Sherman says. And that's where I will offer a alternate, alternating series of prompts between uh, you and Jeff. And I'll start out with Sherman, uh, to which uh, I hope to elicit a, a top of my response. And I'll, I'll start out with Sherman first as the example. And this one for you, Sherman, is crypto exchanges. And the future. Uh, over to you, Lori, with ESG. Absolutely the future. Durable. Uh, definitely the issue of our time. All right. Back to Sherman with chip shortage. Serious implications. All right. Labor market. Probably hotter than we realize. Retail sales. <laughs> hotter than we realize. <laughs> I, I think that there's more there's more demand coming. You know, if you looked around, especially here in the good weather. So uh, people are excited and, um, you know, they're looking to do something. And so that includes uh, buying all right, back to you, Lori, with 75% vaccination target. Achievable, but likely not to get there. Emerging market recovery. Achievable, will get there, will take longer. So, Lori, you'll see I like to play off the other person's uh, response. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Uh, right back um, at you. <laughs> it'll be slower, and it's going to be a have and have not, unfortunately. And so, Hopefully we can we can get this rolled out by next year and get them vaccinated as well in, in a meaningful manner. All right. Uh, back to you, Lori, with gold. Not right now. Except for jewelry. <laughs> it's always nice, right? <laughs> There's always a holiday around the corner, Lori. Keep those Indeed. retail sales popping. Yeah. All right. Uh, last one for each of you here with the one for Sherman is 10-year yield. Uh, consolidating for the next leg up in yield. So good time to heed Lori's advice on managing duration and make sure you know what you own. All right. And the final one for the today is Fed taper. Not this year, not next year, probably 23. All right. I like that. I like that. Okay. So this is a rocket and rolling in <laughs> Fed we trust. So Thanks, Lori. We really appreciate the time. Again, Lori is the global CIO at State Street Global Advisors. She's been very generous with her time today. Thank you all for listening. As I mentioned at the onset, uh, you can catch us on the YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash double line capital. Uh, we can get us where the podcasts are served out there. Sam's telling me now there's like a Google podcast. There's a SoundCloud. We know most of you get it from iTunes. There's always the good old tried and true double line website. Um, so we'll get it out there. Also, I uh, want to uh, give, a, give a shout out to Sam, who's now doing another podcast with Jeff Mayberry, the Monday uh, Morning Minutes that was released before the bell every Monday. I think, I think except this one, uh, as we updated our website, it didn't get out till a half an hour after the bell. I won't blame Sam and Jeff for that, but it's a great, great little market recap. They definitely go through a lot of economic data, less cold to personality. So definitely uh, more for the, the nerdy wonky types. Um, this one's already pretty nerdy enough, but uh, if you're looking for it, that's great. And then also check Channel 11, a uh, new, new show hosted by Ken Shinoda. Uh, we're putting out uh, pretty good content there every single month. Uh, you usually have uh, once a month, there's a guest on there. The last one was probably his worst one he's had because the guest was me. So unfortunately, if you want to hear, if, you, if you're if you subjected to that, you can go listen to more of it there. But we appreciate you listening, Lori. Again, thanks for your time today. It was a great conversation. Look forward to seeing you in person in the near future. Indeed. Thank you. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.